so we, we are streaming and i think uh charles might be uh delayed a little bit but we'll start so that we don't uh hold everything up so this is the launch of the charles uh goodhart hour okay which we're going to call the uh, charles goodhart seminar series on uh tuesdays uh which is hosted jointly uh, by the Better Policy Project and uh, the Central Bank of Armenia and the National Bank of Georgia, so the Global Forecasting School and so on. And and so uh, we like to think of uh, of the Global Forecasting School at this point as uh, output is equal to age, okay, uh, where A stands for Armenians, um, G stands for Georgians, and the E stands for experience, where Charles um, uh, has uh, probably one of the most uh, extensive uh, CVs in the macro and monetary policy literature. So he's uh, agreed uh, to join us approximately uh, once per month and to get feedback uh, on our research. Some of our research is very much related to a book uh, that uh, that him and Anush Pradam uh, wrote in 2020, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go over that book because uh, we're gonna be building off of many of the ideas in that book. Uh, we're also gonna be building off of some ideas that uh, that I have had uh over the years uh as well as some of the research that i've done with uh co-authors like uh hamid faruke who's going to be here on thursday uh where we're going to be uh, uh showing people how we uh put age-specific mortality you might find that kind of strange that that we'd be modeling uh age-specific mortality but we're trying to do it in a macro framework uh, that makes everything uh, analytically tractable. In other words, things that we can put into uh, into our models uh, or number crunching kind of uh, machine. So what are we going to talk about today uh, is I would say uh, we could we could put under four key layers, okay, of things, issues that we'll be facing uh, uh, economists, policymakers, not just over the next year or five years, but uh, but unfortunately, maybe forever, <laughs> uh, and certainly over the next uh, 50 years. So uh, one is demographics, uh, aging in particular. And so Highcast at the very end of the presentation is going to go through an extended version of our global integrated monetary fiscal model to think about the aging problem in countries like Japan, where 10% of the population uh, is over the age of 80, and they're facing a big decline in the working age population. So how do they how do they take care of, uh, of their elderly uh, people, uh, given that they have a dwindling uh, supply of labor. And so the answer is obviously going to be some combination uh, of uh, of workers, getting workers from other countries like the Philippines. So we're going to build a three-country model uh, with uh, Japan, the Philippines, and the rest of the world where, where we consider policy options where they get the labor from the Philippines. But in addition to that, we're going to talk about technology, which is going to be one of the layers um, uh, in particular um robots uh and artificial intelligence how can that uh in increase the productivity of of unskilled workers that take care of older people and so the uh so one of the layers the second layer we're going to call migration macroeconomics so i'm going to go through a little bit of that so the first layer is uh aging and demographics Second layer is migration, macroeconomics, and we're going to think about that as um, what do you need to do uh, uh, in terms of the structural changes uh, to basically uh, 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 effectively use technology uh, uh, as well as labor uh, to solve uh, the problem. So 
three layers, demographics, uh, migration, macroeconomics, and, and how to use technology. And the fourth layer, okay, sorry about this, uh, that, that we have so many uh, layers, uh, is you can think of it as availability of natural resources. So we're not going to think of technology like Robert Solo thought about technology, where uh, the primary consideration is uh, dealing with population change, uh, uh, where you can use things like uh, uh, labor, you know, like a Cobb Douglas uh, uh, production function and so on. But we're going to think of uh, uh, situations where you actually choose the technology. And when you think about that, you will also have to have an ample supply of, of natural resources. So uh, the solution, for example, for very rich, advanced economies in terms of uh, the types of robots and technology they use might be different. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, about that. Okay, so that's the four layers. Now, uh, we're obviously concerned about policy. Uh, and when we think of policy, one aspect of policy is financial stability. Um, and so obviously uh, using uh, monetary and fiscal policy very aggressively during COVID has, has resulted in a truly outstanding, like mind boggling increase in the value of household assets. And I'm referring to like financial assets as well as uh, non-financial assets, effectively uh, property prices. And so what, what happened during COVID? Well, uh, initially when we locked down in the, you know, in the first quarter of uh, 2020, asset prices did what they should do. They fell because they're, they're, they're the expected discounted uh, uh, sub uh, future output. And with lower output, uh, we should have lower equity prices. But with the highly stimulatory policies, we had a whopping $43 trillion increase in the value of uh, U.S. household assets. This is a truly staggering number. With the increase in the SMP that we've observed um, over the last uh, few months, we will get another $10 trillion increase in assets. So the 43 trillion is already over twice, over twice the value of 2019 GDP. So if, uh, you know, if you thought that there was an asset price bubble, like Bill White, for example, uh, and me, if you thought there was an asset price bubble before COVID, there's certainly an asset price bubble now. And one issue about uh, this is what has been uh, the driver of the bubble. And this is very much related to uh, Charles Goodhart's work and my work on endogenous money creation, that uh, when you uh, 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 push liquidity into the system or allow the system the financial system to develop liquidity, you end up creating a lot of purchasing power. And that purchasing power to be, can be used to, to buy consumption goods, to buy investment goods. It can also be used to purchase existing assets and can result in an increase in, in property prices and, uh, and asset prices like equity prices. This is looking at uh, the issue from the point of view that the two leading uh, variables, uh, effectively excessive credit expansion or liabilities in the in the household sector, um, uh, and of course uh, uh, increases in property prices. Property prices, in particular, are the uh, that it combined with leverage are the best two variables for predicting the probabilities of a financial crisis. So if you were to look at liabilities of the of the US household sector at this point, as a share of disposable income, you would say, well, it doesn't look that worrisome. Uh, because if you look, say, back before the global financial crisis, there was a much larger buildup in liabilities than there is now. And so the problem is this, <laughs> uh, our consumption functions uh, are fitting again, <laughs> our, our consumption functions that include 
this measure of wealth. And so the, the simple story in these consumption functions, most normal consumption functions, is that is that uh, consumption uh, uh, depends on a uh, pretty small marginal propensity to consume out of this wealth that can be spread so out over many many years just think of uh you know people retiring and uh uh and and starting to consume out of that financial wealth and 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 out of that uh housing wealth maybe they downsize their house or or they simply turn their uh, equity portfolio into an income stream so that would be consistent with the empirical evidence now what is worrisome about that is that is that when people consume more, they also consume more housing, and so, and they take more loans, and and so that uh, empirical fact, uh, given this massive, uh, humongous, not massive, humongous uh, increase in asset prices, could translate into an increase in leverage over the next few years, and then that would satisfy that condition. That these two leading indicators uh, uh, could suggest that a financial crisis uh, might be on, uh, might be, might be in our, uh, unfortunately, in our, in our medium-term outlook, not our very longer-term outlook, but an outlook over the next, over the next four to five uh, years, and so on. And that's very worrisome. Now, Charles uh, wrote a book uh, with Manoush uh, Pradhan, published uh, in. 2020 and what and what's amazing is uh is the prediction uh, uh that these guys made because uh, uh in the book they predicted that inflation in 2021 was going to go to at least five percent uh probably ten percent uh which of course uh is approximately uh, uh what happened uh and uh and so that that was a, a very uh, a very uh, interesting uh, prediction. The book is also full of uh, some great uh, facts, charts, and so on. And so one obviously is the uh, the chart on the left, uh, which shows uh, the working age population uh, in the advanced uh, economy. So what are referred to in the chart is the developed market economies, uh, as well as uh, uh, the working age population in China and uh, in Eastern Europe, which is the, the, the yellow line. And you can see that uh, in the yellow line, it kind of peaks at about 1.2 billion people and then falls uh, uh, by more than 100 uh, million people. Uh, so the aging problem and its effect on the working age population is enormous uh, uh, in China and those advanced economies. But it's also obviously very important in in the advanced economies, the, uh, like uh, like in the blue line, uh, or what is referred to as the as the developed uh, economies. Now, what's interesting uh, is that Africa. Uh, uh, is going in the other uh, direction. So a lot of this um, uh, future labor that we might need uh, uh, to fuel uh, the international economy might might actually be in Africa. We're not used to thinking about uh, growth coming uh, uh, from Africa. The graph on the right, you can just see the year by year uh, changes. And I think the line that's kind of the most interesting one here is the is the world uh, uh, excluding Africa? Uh, uh, another way of, of looking at uh, the importance of Africa. Here we have uh, some charts, and these charts are very much going to motivate our analytical framework, uh, the analytical framework that Hamid Faruke and I developed uh, in the mid 1990s. Okay, so remember, we had a debt problem in the 1980s, high. Uh, real interest rates, uh, basically a big recession when we disinflated uh, in the early 1980s. Well, that turned into a debt problem. And that debt problem that initially was caused by, by basically contractionary monetary policies and double-digit unemployment that 
that basically reduced tax revenues in in many uh, in many economies. That showed up as deficits. Well, those deficits became every bigger because of uh, policies like the Reagan tax cuts uh, that also resulted in about a about a twenty percentage point increase in the government debt to GDP ratio in the OECD countries. And then subsequent to that, uh, because people were concerned about the crowding out effects of debt, uh, they went through a period in the 1990s of fiscal consolidation and so on. So the analytical framework that we develop uh, builds off of of work by uh, Olivier Blanchard in his 1985 JPE paper, where he had uh, finite planning rights. And so what Hamid and I did in the 1990s uh, was to incorporate life cycle income profiles into that model. And those and those models then became the foundational building blocks for all the DSGE models that we developed at the IMF. So I'm referring to uh, multi-mod initially. Um, we would refer to that as a semi-structural DSGE model. Uh, and then later, uh, the global fiscal model. Uh, so that's a model that... Um, that I developed uh, 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 with Dennis Botman uh, at the International Monetary Fund. And then the later version, uh, which is the global integrated monetary fiscal model that HiCast is gonna be talking about. So uh, you're looking at the screen right now, uh, uh, what the life cycle income profiles uh, that Charles uh, reported in his book uh, with Manoush. Uh, and you can see that you can obviously see the life cycle income profiles that uh, labor income, uh, uh, you start off your life when you're young uh, and you're not uh, very productive. And then of course you learn uh, and become more experienced and your productivity kind of peaks uh, according to these charts, uh, somewhere between kind of 40 and uh, 50. And then you get old, okay? Unfortunately, guys like me become uh, less productive uh, obviously, if you compare my productivity with the younger people, you'll see that this chart is absolutely true. Uh, my productivity is uh, is almost, uh, 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 I don't know, almost zero compared to the productivity of, uh, of, of the younger people uh, and, uh, and so on. You also see some neat little things here is the effect of retirement. And so obviously, in advanced economies that are richer, uh, you retire earlier. So obviously, your labor income tails off whereas in poorer countries you have to work longer consumption charts are you know you obviously see consumption smoothing you see uh what franco medigliani uh was getting us to think about the life cycle theory of uh of consumption so when people are facing a hump shaped uh income profile labor income profile uh you know they try to they try to spread that out through their uh, lifetime. Uh, and you can see that uh, that the advanced economies uh, seem to do a better job at that. But what's interesting is that there's a little spike up at the end uh, when you look at uh, uh, over the age of, uh, of 85, you can see that consumption uh, really goes up. I haven't read the book. But that's quite interesting because uh, we do know that in the very later stages of life, uh, it can take an enormous amount of resources uh, and enormous amount of resources is spent on 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 people that, uh, you know, are 85 and higher taking uh, uh, care of them uh, and so on. Whereas if you look at, uh, at lower income uh, emerging markets, you can actually see consumption kind of tailing off. Uh, as you get up into those into those really older ages. Now, government debt, uh, this is something uh, that I agree with uh, with Charles and Manoush, uh, uh, you know, 100%. Uh, when we look at government debt, uh, historically, say in the United States, uh, big increases in, in the war, okay? But, but after wars, debt tends to fall, okay? And the increase in debt that we see now, uh, we wouldn't describe it as uh, as wartime debt. Uh, it's, 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 it's totally self-inflicted, totally self-inflicted by 
uh, by the government just deciding to run uh, big uh, deficits in a low interest rate environment. Okay, so uh, why did the government debt to GDP ratio fall after the Second World War? Very simple. Uh, we had a big increase in productivity growth. You could think of it almost as pent up, pent up demand and supply. You go to war, and we had already discovered electricity um, uh, well before we went to war. Uh, but uh, the, all those diffusion processes for creating all the things that we created, uh, uh, like automobiles and cars and and all the gadgets that we put in uh, in our in our modern uh, advanced economy uh, bu uh, bundle of goods that uh, that we consume. That stuff was put on hold, and the war ends, and all of a sudden, obviously, you you unleash those forces of 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 you know that are going to sustain high productivity growth, uh, basically up until uh, the mid nineteen sixties. Okay, and then productivity growth starts to starts to actually slow down. Uh, uh, so that's why uh, government debt uh, uh, fell. Something similar happened during the the clinton period in the uh in the 1990s so there was an increase in productivity growth that the uh that that the clinton administration did not spend and so as a result there was a uh, there was a period of of lower but going forward we just uh, reviewed the congressional budget offices projections uh of both the budget and their assumptions for the economy. And it looks worrisome. Uh, they assume that basically the interest rate on government debt is just a tad higher than the growth rate of nominal GDP. So for nominal GDP, they use our assumptions uh, uh, of 2% real growth and 2% inflation, that's 4%. Their 10-year bond rate is about 4.1%. So, uh, uh, on the basis of that, you might not be worried about fiscal uh, sustainability, but if you believe, uh, like like we do, uh, in a view closer to Larry Summers, where maybe the ten-year bond rate could be uh, closer to five percent, if we had a five percent ten-year bond rate, which is approximately the uh, the effective uh, rate uh, on uh, what finances U.S. government debt? So the average maturity structure is just just a bit lower than ten years. So if all the debt rolled over at five percent, well, if interest rates are are one percentage point above uh, the growth rate of the economy, it means that if the primary balance was zero, which it's not, it's 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 a two to three percent uh, deficit in their projection. But if it was if it was zero, if they could get it back to zero, you would still have a debt to GDP ratio with a 5% interest rate that would be exploding at the rate of one percentage point per year. So in their projections, it's it's uh, it's approximately 100% this year. And so that would mean um, uh, 101, 102, 103. Uh, and of course, uh, when you look at their projections, all the way up to 172%. Now, what do we make of that? Well, the thing that is really worrisome of that, about that, because it's only based on a 4% interest rate, is it would be expanding a lot more rapidly than that. Now, what about the empirics there about when does or when do financial markets uh, become really concerned about these fiscal dynamics? And the answer is, if there's a perception that the fiscal dynamics are not sustainable, that will result in an increase in the term premium. So uh, you might, if you assume that the 10 year bond rate, that we're going into an environment of high uh, real short term rates and a, and a renormalization of the term premium, then if we start going down that road, it's quite likely on that road that at some point there will be a perception that the fiscal uh, dynamics are not sustainable, in which case, who is gonna hold a 10-year bond 
when there's a risk that interest rates might be higher in the future. And uh, so who is going to hold that bond without getting adequate compensation for interest rate risk? In other words, uh, the term premium. So once you start thinking about a high interest rate environment, the uh, the internal dynamics push you towards an even higher interest rate once there's a perception, much like the European debt crisis. Now, the, the question is, is this a problem for the U.S.? Obviously, with uh, them having reserve currency status, they can they can go on uh, in this game much longer than most uh, vulnerable economies uh, uh, where we'd start to see problems uh, when government debt to GDP ratios are you know, over over a hundred percent. So uh, Charles in his book uh, goes through, uh, come, arrives at almost exactly the same conclusion uh, that I'm, what I'm saying now, what could solve this problem? One is that maybe growth isn't 2%, maybe it could be higher. That's true, uh, uh, but unlikely that it would be enough uh, to deal with the problem. Uh, taxation, Obviously, yes. The United States is one of the only countries in the world that's left that doesn't have a consumption tax. Virtually every country in the world has replaced their income taxes with consumption taxes because they want to get more tax revenue. Uh, they want to distort. So anytime you're concerned about fiscal dynamics, uh, consumption tax is a natural option because you're not discouraging work effort. You're not dis you're not you so a consumption tax you're 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 taking uh, resources out of the economy okay uh, but uh, uh, sorry when you're taxing uh, output you're taxing labor and you're taxing capital you're taking resources away from the economy okay whereas uh, consumption tax you're discouraging consumption and encouraging saving so you're you're that kind of policy is 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 trying to increase output relative to uh, labor tax or 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 a capital tax, uh, but that's there's no chance uh, uh, that anything like that would happen uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, because of the it's just not politically uh, uh, feasible to think about that. So uh, so there's only one thing left uh, to fix up debt dynamics, and that's inflation. And so, you know, one possibility is, is that you could announce a higher inflation target. That's not going to work uh, because as soon as the market uh, gets wind that you're going to announce a higher inflation target, the inflation premium will probably be embodied in 10-year bond rates. So that's not going to help. Uh, might help in the short run. Might take a while for the debt to roll over and stuff like that. So you'll have a short-term benefit. But but it, you know, if you're playing a game between uh, government and financial markets, uh, financial markets can move a lot faster. Uh, so once you go start going down a bad road, uh, now, so the question is, what would uh, inflation then be? It would be effectively the Fed getting soft on inflation, realizing uh, that there is no other way to have macroeconomic stability. Uh, but to be soft on inflation. So that's the way I think uh, you want to think about it. Um, uh, it's going to happen uh, if we're in a high interest rate environment. The central bank has to resist uh, these higher interest rates. And what that means is that when they manage the short run output inflation trade off or, or the short run uh, uh, output inflation, uh, financial stability, fiscal sustainability trade off. Uh, they will have to uh, put more emphasis on fiscal sustainability or low interest rates and financial stability, which are very much related. So we're totally in agreement. This is just, uh, again, the second layer of our big uh, research agenda here is migration uh, macroeconomics. So this is just looking at a, at a few charts so that uh, we can see clearly uh, that these issues are probably going to be with us for a very long time. So this is just uh, why do people uh, move? Uh, obviously, they want to move to a, a country uh, that has uh, that highest higher uh, living standards. So that's obviously one reason. Another reason uh, that obviously has been uh, really prescient 
recently uh, is conflict. People want to get out of areas uh, where there's conflict. Now, now this is obviously also uh, going to interact with with probably climate change. Uh, the world has enormous amounts of fresh water, but the problem is that there are certain parts of the world where the water supply might be threatened. Okay, and just to mention a couple, uh, Bangkok uh, and Cairo. Uh, if we were to observe uh, uh, climate change uh, resulting in, uh, then th th unfortunately, this is just a couple of examples of the potential uh, types of threats that could result in uh, humanitarian uh, disasters, uh, you know, much, much bigger migration flows than, than what we've seen recently. So migration is really important. Thinking about ma migration as a uh, development uh, uh, tool, uh, or as, as Highcast is going to think about it, uh, more as something that is needed to be done because the working age population is declining and you have to take care of older people. Technology, and Highcast gonna, is going to talk about this and our work is going uh, is going to really feature this stuff. How big is technology right now? In other words, when we think about artificial intelligence, uh, what is it? like it, like it, how would we compare it to the types of technological uh, revolutions that we've seen in the past? At this point, things like artificial intelligence, chat GPT, things like that, just look like uh, uh, important labor saving uh, kind of devices, albeit, albeit enormous labor saving devices that could displace enormous amount of workers. Like a uh, really good example, a good friend of mine uh, just created a, an AI company in Mumbai uh, and he, he's a, a world-class uh, marketing uh, genius. Uh, he says 80% labor, 80% less labor. Uh, and the labor that we're talking about are executives, marketing executives, um, uh, like not um, uh, undergraduate university students. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, graduate students uh, that we no longer need because artificial intelligence is uh, is replacing those. So the whole definition of what is unskilled and what is skilled is being challenged by artificial intelligence and so on. We're gonna talk about uh, robots. Um, uh, artificial intelligence is also being used uh, for things like voice recognition and, and that technology is getting better and better. So. Uh, robots actually uh, 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 are, they're already robots that are companions uh, for older uh, people. Uh, there are lots of things that uh, um, that robots can be used for um, to help uh, deal with the, uh, with the aging issues and the dwindling uh, population. Now, the analytical framework that we're going to be using builds a lot off of some work that I did at the International Monetary Fund. I should thank uh, David Lipton. David Lipton uh, was the guy that uh, that got me to do this. David Lipton and and uh, Maury Ofsfeld and Vitor Gaspar, uh, who are all listed, uh, they were the three economic counselors uh, where we put uh, what we call the three C's approach to uh, economic policy coordination when policy space is limited. So why are we concerned about this? Because one of the things we're concerned is the uh, Blanchard view that the real equilibrium interest rate uh, could be low, that we, we just, uh, just like we could be going uh, into the summer's uh, world of high interest rates, there's also a possibility that we could be going back to the world where the low ec real interest rate. Now, now all of these issues, as Olivier uh, points out, uh, seem to be related to saving. And so, in other words, the number one thing he points to uh, uh, is the increase in life expectancy 
that might have been driving uh, the downward trend in the equilibrium real interest rate. So he might be right. We have no idea <laughs> because we have no models. Uh, and so part of the work that we're doing right now uh, is to take uh, the analytical frameworks that we developed at the, at the IMF, models like uh, the Global Integrated Monetary Fiscal Model, to start studying those kinds of issues and quantifying uh, with some type of analytical framework, whether or not the Blashard view is right, that uh, that the world real interest rate is really low. We don't have to worry about fiscal. Uh, we have to worry about the effect of lower bound <laughs> and, and stop worrying about fiscal because we might have to use fiscal uh, yet again. That's the Blanchard kind of view. Now, what we did when we were doing this paper was to think about uh, the implications of economies like Japan that was stuck at the effect of lower bound for years. And so part of the issue that we were concerned with when we wrote this paper was what if uh, more countries in the world were to be constrained by that effect of lower bound? And so we can see in terms of uh, the recovery from the global financial crisis, we had a period of sustained high unemployment and economic slack and policies were insufficient uh, to basically eliminate uh, this economic slack. In fact, it, we had just eliminated it uh, before COVID. Okay, so how do you deal with uh, a situation where you have to you have to increase growth to make things sustainable? You have to have supporting, so you need structural policies to do that, but you also need to have you need to have supporting. Uh, macroeconomic policies that make sure that your structural policies are sustainable. In other words, uh, uh, when you do these uh, structural pol policies, if they have harmful implications for the income distribution or they have harmful harmful implications for, for aggregate demand, they create unemployment, then you have to make sure that you have the supporting macroeconomic policies and so on so that's what we mean by by comprehensive that you can't just think about policies in terms of monetary policy doing its thing and fiscal policy doing its thing and structural policy you have to combine these policies particularly when uh policies are constrained in some way like the effect of lower balance second thing is consistent and that's very much related to all the work that I've done over the years, helping central banks develop consistent policy frameworks. And that's what we refer to as FPAS uh, Mark uh, One and Mark Two, or uh, what we called in the book that Maury Oswald and Tobias Adrian and I wrote, uh, flexible inflation targeting or inflation forecast targeting, and then coordination. And so uh, for for some of these situations, uh, like the effect of lower bound, you obviously have to coordinate domestic policies. Uh, you want to coordinate monetary and fiscal uh, because the two of those things that are working together are going to have much larger multipliers than if they work uh, uh, by themselves. So you might think of that as, as coordination or you might take a softer view about coordination and call it uh, cooperation from time to time when it's needed. But the idea and what we showed in in 3C is that, that when you combine these policies, uh, it increases the likelihood of success uh, uh, because the good outcomes make them uh, more uh, credible and so on. So this is just an example of looking at the experiences of the what we call the inflation forecast targeting central banks versus the, the not uh, 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 inflation forecast targeting central banks, Bank of Japan and, and the European Central Bank. Both of those uh, economic areas, Japan and the Euro area, were suffering from a low inflation trap before COVID. Okay, so... Uh, Japan was stuck at the effect of lower bound for years uh, and could not escape it. Long-term inflation expectations 
were, you know, around zero, sometimes even negative, and so on. In the case of Europe, they had long-term inflation expectations at about one and a half percent. They just couldn't quite get it up to two. And you might say, well, why do you care about that? And the answer is because it means that they have less policy space, like exactly what happened during COVID. Uh, so going into COVID, uh, the Fed had managed to get inflation up and get long-term inflation expectations anchored uh, to the to the 2% target, whereas the ECB was still at the effect of lower bound. And uh, by failing uh, to get inflation up and long-term inflation expectations anchored, when they went into COVID, they obviously had less policy space. And obviously they got hammered during uh, 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 2020. Uh, output contracted uh, much more uh, in uh, in the euro area than it did, did in, the, in the United States. So the three C's approach uh, is, is going to be the, uh, I think the right way to think about macroeconomic policies, both domestic policy coordination, but also international policy coordination, because a lot of these issues that we're referring to can't stop at the border, like things like climate change. Uh, uh, many of those issues have to be solved uh, globally. Uh, and unfortunately, that's going to require uh, cooperation, coordination, that we're just not we're just not seeing it and and that is uh very very worrisome so on a uh, on a more optimistic note <laughs> i guess we'll now uh, uh take us through uh how at least for countries like japan what types of policies uh, high gas uh do you think uh we could be we could consider for an economy like Japan, again, um, uh, ten percent of the population above the age of eighty, um, dwindling uh, labor supply. So, please, I guess. Doctor, uh, will it be time for me to comment at some stage? Oh, I'm sorry, Charles. Yes, of course, Charles. Yes, yes. I please, I, I, did, I, I didn't. How long is this session going? And if it's supposed to end in an hour, I don't think there'll be yeah. for me. So what can happen? So Charles, we would no, please, okay, uh, please. I didn't know you were there. Um, uh, please, you, you, the floor is yours. Okay, we can, we can carry on with this technical stuff at some later time. So please, Charles. Well, I obviously, Douglas, I agree very much about this sort of general thrust uh, of your comments, and I'll take that as read. So what I'll do is I'll try and comment on a number of issues or a number of questions where I have slightly different views or where I think that there are questions that maybe your approach hasn't dealt with yet. Um, let me to start back to front. Um, first, Olivier Blanchard has actually changed his views slightly recently. I was on a, a discussion with him. Uh, he now expects the rate of growth, G, to be roughly equal to the nominal in interest rate in future years. So he accepts that in order to maintain debt sustainability, it will be necessary for uh, the uh, public sector deficit in the US to be cut back to zero and for safety to actually be slightly in surplus. The next point I would make is that you talked about the US Treasury market uh, as being the sort of centerpiece of the world. Um, and in many ways it is. Uh, but one of the features that you'll have to remember uh, is that a large amount of the increase in, in US debt, in T-bonds, has been met by inflows from countries like um, China in particular. And the effect of the sanctions which the US has put in place is, I think, going to mean that uh, countries such as China again 
and the oil producing countries are going to be much more careful about putting a lot of their money into the US in case it gets effectively stuck if geopolitical situation uh, should deteriorate it. In that case, one of the interesting questions for future years is where will the surplus countries, again, China and the oil producing countries, actually put their money? And that's actually not, in my view, not at all clear. Again, you talked about the massive increase in asset valuations, and I entirely agree with that. Uh, but one of the interesting questions is why did property, particularly housing prices, not collapse when interest rates got raised so very rapidly um, and by quite a large amount. I know four or five percent increase in interest rates is not insignificant. And in the old days, one would have expected a, a sharp decline in property prices. It happened in commercial real estate to some large extent, and that is still a weakness in many of the advanced economies. But it hasn't happened in housing prices. And one of the questions here is why? Um, again, the discussion about future movements and in investment almost entirely focuses on corporate investment and ignores housing investment. And the effect of demography is not going to weaken housing investment that much, partly because old people don't like moving and they usually try and expand their housing up to a point in which they can uh, provide rooms for their children. And when their children leave home, they don't downsize because it's un unattractive. Um, you discussed the increase in life expectancy. One of the points that needs to be made is that life expectancy is no longer rising, at least not in the US nor in the UK. Life expectancy in the US has fallen over the last six or seven years, stagnated in the UK. I'm not sure about Europe. And one of, and perhaps my key point of all is that the almost all the macroeconomists who have studied or take into account demography don't take into account health. And it is actually the growth of the incapacitated that puts such an enormous strain on resources, particularly public sector resources. And as you said, Douglas, the reason why the consumption of the old goes up at the end when you get over 85, which I currently am, uh, is that uh, there's a huge amount of expenditure needed uh, on medicines and care, almost all of which gets paid for by the state. Again, because since becoming incapacitated, particularly with the neurological diseases of the old, uh, like dementia and Parkinson's, is a lottery. You don't know whether you're going to get it or not. And therefore, people don't save against the expectation or the possibility that they might get one of these diseases because you just don't know and you tend to hope that it won't occur. So <clears throat> rather than worrying about age-specific mortality, I would worry about age-specific incapacity because it's the incapacity that really drives <clears throat> public sector expenditure. Um, on that, you give out some hope that the uh, incapacitated old uh, with these neurological diseases um, might get aided by robots. To an extent, yes, but what people really need is, is empathy. And it's actually quite difficult still to make a robot react empathetically to a, to a human. And frankly, I, and I think that um, even when you've got dementia, uh, you get more fed up with the machine than you get fed up with a person. So I'd be limited with my enthusiasm uh, for robots. You are absolutely right uh, about migration. Um, and it's one of the things that in our work you were kind enough to cite that I and my co-author Manoj Pradhan did, 
uh, we didn't appreciate was the massive surge in migration into the US and into the UK and into Europe that has actually occurred in the years since lockdown got removed. And that has meant that the, the tightness of labor markets and the resulting inflation in the last year or so has actually been less than we had expected uh, because the shift between the ratio of workers and dependents has actually been much less severe than we had expected because migration was so large. Uh, but you talk about migration into the countries which have got uh, very sharply declining birth rates and sharply declining working populations in the, in the future. Uh, these are particularly in Asia, uh, with Korea and China having fertility rates of under one per woman. And you know, South Korea was recently down to 0.7. Now, as, as the chart showed, uh, where the population, the working population is, is in Africa. Now, it's frequently said that, uh, and to some extent, I'm afraid it is true, um, that the sort of the white majority countries in Europe and North America are racist. But if I make a comparison with Asia, I don't think that the European North American countries are anything like as racist as the Asians. I mean, the idea of African, massive migration of Africans to Asia, I, I think at the, under present conditions is politically just not feasible. Um, and the, then that raises the question of what does happen in Asia, because the demographic difficulties are going to be far worse there um, than they are actually in Europe, <coughs> which of course raises again the question of what's going to happen to China, uh, which is a, a fascinating discussion, uh, which um, I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to, um, but it certainly is, is, is one of the key issues uh, that we'll all have to face in coming, in coming periods. But um, anyhow, um, uh, that's enough for me, but I did did want to just have uh, the chance of commenting on um, a research program that I think is absolutely splendid, but more, more concentration on health rather than life expectancy. You're absolutely right to focus on migration. What a fascinating and difficult issue. <clears throat> um, and more attention to housing as one of the main areas where investment can occur. Um, and uh, what are the surplus countries going to do with their uh, money that they've earned from having a current account surplus? And now that any foreign country must be aware that putting money with the US could mean that if they were on the wrong side of some geopolitical problem, that the money would get um, would get stuck. So those are a number of questions that I uh, or sort of issues that I think are important to add to the excellent uh, agenda that you have in progress. Thank you, uh, uh, Charles. All those remarks. I wanted to get your reaction to uh, to the first one. Okay, but I agree. Uh, with everything that you said, but I just want to go specifically back um, to the question about U.S. house prices and asset prices in in general, like interest rates have uh, normalized, and and how do you think about that? And so the way we actually got some uh, some comments at the symposium uh, uh, by uh, by Larry Summers about kind of thinking about this as uh, as different regimes and and just sort of uh expressing humility and, and admission of our ignorance about uh how the the world works and so when i think about those kinds of things and i think about endogenous money creation 
which is very much how I think about the world, both in normal times and and during crises. Uh, I don't understand. Okay, but 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 we uh, uh, we create purchasing power. You need purchasing power to buy consumption goods and to buy investment goods and to buy houses and especially expensive houses uh, uh, and expensive equities. And and so when I just look at the world, I go, wow, uh, look at look at the crazy stuff that could uh, and it could happen in the world and in our modern uh, financial system. So uh, that might just be a, a sheer uh, expression of ignorance, but but uh, I think expressing things that we don't really understand is okay, uh, and recognizing that in the past high property prices and high leverage are uh, are a good indicator of 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 a financial uh, crisis. But uh, but it's I, I don't I can't say anything more than that aside from uh, expressing how little I really understand about why property prices are so high. Now, one way to think about that is that we're all just learning about these things. So the private sector is learning about these things. Uh, the policymakers are learning about these things. And there's some truth that we're, that we're both trying to find. Okay, so that would be a way of, of thinking about it. There could be also things about uh, changes in... in um, so in our models, we introduced a lot of myopia because uh, when the interest rate goes to zero asset prices should go to infinity if there's no myopia so with this uh with this framework uh that we have uh that builds on uh, on blanchard's work there's a probability of death and we don't have to think of that probability of death as necessarily biological death and so one thinks of that as a time varying parameter we can we can help explain in general equilibrium uh why asset prices don't explode they just they just go to mars okay now uh that thing could vary over time that that would be one way of of thinking about it in 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 general uh equilibrium to to explain the specific issue about about why uh, uh interest rates could rise um uh uh and uh and property prices don't uh crash and equity prices don't crash but that's more of a a, a mechanical kind of calculation uh, of just what we need to do <laughs> to to get our bottles to to think about fitting uh, uh, the real world and stuff. On your other issues, robots could help in the following way, Charles. Like you talked about empathy and and so on. Okay, and um, I think of it as ignorance. And so the lack of empathy is you know when you're my mother for example had. Uh, paranoia dementia and we just didn't understand it like we didn't understand the changes that she was going through that started in the 50 in like in her 19 like when she was 50 uh, uh, uh she just started changing um and so on and and we didn't understand it uh, uh we're totally ignorant about what was going on and we didn't know how to handle her okay we we we, we, we didn't have enough uh, it wasn't I would say we had compassion and empathy, but we didn't know how to take her out of a world of, uh, you know, of frustration uh, that something was happening uh, to her. She was terribly fearful of being put into a geriatric uh, facility. It was like her worst nightmare. Uh, and so she had <laughs> she had managed to fool. <laughs> I would say all, most of the people around her. Uh, uh, she would practice tricks about uh, going through her purse uh, to see how quickly uh, she could pass a, the test with a doctor uh, to show that she was uh, uh, mentally uh, uh, capable and stuff. But she had paranoia dementia, and we just didn't understand it until I would say it was like the third stage of it. Uh, uh, so I think, how could robots help? I don't see it really as uh, a solution to the problem with empathy, but they might help. They may help people from falling, and and uh, how do you become incapacitated? Uh, uh, somebody has to, you know, uh, watch you if you fall and you're fragile. Uh, so some of these things, uh, 
robots might might be able to help but i don't i don't i don't see robots as uh uh as really providing empathy but uh, uh but they you know they 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 might be able to help and make us more productive give us more time so that the humans can have more empathy so i do i may be a bit bit more optimistic uh uh uh, about the use of uh, uh, of robots, not directly providing uh, uh, empathy, um, but yeah, all your all your points are, you know, thank you. We 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 are deeply uh, grateful uh, that you're taking the time to uh, to come at uh, and visit us uh, from time to time. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you have time for high cast by heat high cast, please. If Charles needs to go, I don't want to tax his time, but please. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm fine for another half hour if you want. Okay. I cast, please talk about robots. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, let me share my screen or, or yeah, I'm fine. Uh, Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Guthard, uh, for your uh, feedback. And uh, we are really appreciated uh, that you have some time uh, and spend it with us. So uh, I like to address all these uh, kind of issues which da Doug talked about, uh, like uh, demographical dynamics, this aging, um, like migration economics. Uh, increasing robots and productivity, as well as uh, the natural resources, uh, we need uh, some kind of uh, like framework, uh, framework to utilize and uh, to address the uh, these kind of issues. So, and um, and the framework which we are uh, currently using is based on the original uh, GIMP model, which is Global Integrated Fiscal and Monetary Model, developed at the uh, International Monetary Fund uh, by La uh, Doug Lockstein and his team. So this, uh, this is multi-country model. Uh, so you can, uh, and currently we have the system, so you can make it uh, for two countries, for three countries, for n, uh, n number of countries. Uh, so there is a macro processing, which is uh, generating all these codes, thousands and thousands of uh, equations. And um, so, uh, and the, the model environment, uh, which is inside the GIMP, uh, is very rich and it allows to address uh, address the issues related to the monetary policy uh, as well as fiscal policy. Also, uh, in the in the GIMP, we have the uh, like the financial accelerator uh, banks. So uh, you can also look at the uh, fiscal, uh, I'm sorry, macro potential uh, kind of uh, issues. Uh, so in, in the model, uh, we have uh, a lot of nominal <coughs> and real rigidities. So uh, there is kind of price setting frictions, uh, frictions there uh, sim um, similar to uh, Rothenberg. Uh, there are some adjustment costs, uh, so which makes the prices uh, prices sticky. Uh, as well as uh, we have labor unions, uh, which introduce kind of rigid uh, nominal rigidities into the uh, wage, wage setting uh, decisions. So we have the, uh, uh, the nominal wage rigidities there. As well as uh, there is a bunch of real rigidities uh, uh, like um, investment adjustment costs. Uh, so in the in the model, the uh, the foundational block for the households is based on the uh, Blanchard framework. Uh, so here we have the OLG households, uh, and uh, they are not uh, they have the finite planning horizon. Which introduces myopia and these no Ricard Ricardian uh, features uh, allows to uh, kind of look at the fiscal policy policy issues and uh, because of these no Ricardian features, uh, the fiscal policy uh, has has the real effect a real effect on the economy. In the model, we have um, 
and the three types of distortionary taxes uh, like uh, labor tax, um, capital tax. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, so by a lot of lot of things, there are resources which are used in the production. There are different layers of, of production. So um, firms uh, kind of hiring uh, labor capital, they use some uh, technology to combine it to produce the intermediate goods and this intermediate goods is used in the uh, other stages of the production that it's finally becoming the final uh, final production goods and there is a tradable and non-tradable sectors and there is an import of both the resources which are used in the uh, intermediate stages of production and there is an import and export of the uh, of the final uh, Credible goods. Yeah, and uh, so this is the analytical or the original analytical framework uh, which was uh, developed at the IMF. And the currently uh, currently the modified version of BIGINF, which we are using to address uh, these uh, four layers of the uh, of the problems uh, related to uh, dynamics in demographics, uh, migration, uh, the the robots, and increasing um, in technology. Uh, here, uh, we introduced uh, this uh, this modification. Now we have the uh, skilled capital and skilled labor. Uh, so our OLG households, they supply only the skilled labor, and we have uh, also liquidity constraints households. So these uh, these guys are um, uh, don't have uh, access to uh, to financial markets. They cannot uh, kind of borrow uh, against their future labor. So they consume about uh, whatever uh, they uh, they uh, they get at the current period. Uh, so they uh, supply the unskilled and skilled labor, and uh, in in this uh, in this new modified version version of the GIF, uh, uh, the economy is producing skilled bundle, so called skilled bundle, where it uh, it uses the uh, constant elasticity of substitution production function and uses uh, their so called skilled capital. Uh, the, and uh, skilled labor. So it combines it into the skilled bundle, and we have the unskilled bundle. Then out of this skilled and unskilled uh, bundle, um, uh, at the final stage of the production, we, we are producing tradable and non-tradable goods. But different from the skilled bundle, uh, in the unskilled bundle, uh, we are using the so-called unskilled capital, uh, unskilled labor, and the foreign labor, which, which are uh, migrants. Uh, so uh, currently we uh, have the calibration of this, um, of this model for uh, Japan, uh, Philippines, and the rest of the world. Uh, so in, uh, in our, uh, in our uh, economy, here, uh, let's talk about the Japan. Uh, the foreign labor is a migration from uh, from Philippines and the rest of the world uh, to the advanced to the advanced economy. Uh, and now, now, because we are at the initial, uh, we just uh, uh, just made this uh, this entire system working and uh, trying to. Uh, kind of uh, think about the different policy issues and uh, building building the simulations. So every week we will present uh, kind of progress uh, on our on our research. But uh, at the next uh, next two slides, I'm going to uh, to think about um, about the robots uh, and uh, kind of aging problems. Uh, how we uh, we think about the increase in uh, in robots and technology in in this kind of framework. So when uh, when we look at the second second equation, which is unskilled unskilled by production of the unskilled by bundle, here uh, 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 we can think about the increase of robots as a um, productivity of the unskilled unskilled capital. Uh, right. So when the uh, and uh, 
uh, these elasticities of substitution between uh, between uh, production factors are very uh, crucial for the dynamics uh, dynamics of the model because when the uh, let's think this way when the elasticity of substitution uh, is higher between uh, between production factors in a response uh, to the changing uh, prices of one of the production uh, production input or the productivity of it, uh, it will be much more efficient for the economy uh, to distribute uh, resources in a way uh, to get the higher output rather than uh, the elasticity of substitution between uh, these inputs of, of the production is, is low. And uh, and currently in uh, uh, we try to simulate some scenarios on the increase in robots, which here in this framework we uh, we think that it's a productivity of the unskilled capital. So uh, uh, can we go uh, to the next slide, please? Yeah, um, here we have one percent uh, permanent permanent increase in the productive uh, in the productivity of the unskilled capital uh, so this uh, this unsk uh, unskilled capital we uh, why we call it unskilled because uh, unskilled labor using it to produce some kind of, of intermediate uh, intermediate uh, uh, bundle of consumption uh, consumption goods so when uh, the productivity of uh, of the capital in increases, um, so the production uh, process is becoming much more productive, and uh, in the long run we will have uh, the higher level of uh, of GDP and higher level uh, level of investments. But here uh, we can think about the differences uh, differences between the elasticities of substitution between these factors. When it's uh, kind of five, it's 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 high. Uh, that means that when when robots uh, robots are increasing uh, in the production process, they can much more efficiently substitute the low skilled uh, low skilled labor and low skilled uh, migrant labor and uh, make the distribution of resources much more productive. That's why at the long run uh, we have the higher level of the uh, output compared to the. Uh, let's say to the country or to the case, and this elasticity of substitution is low and much more uh, uh, my, and less uh, in a less efficient way. Uh, the utilization of resources will be utilized. Uh, and and the next um, and the next uh, scenario which we are um, uh, which we are thinking about, of course, we will um, incorporate the comments uh, the comments from uh, Professor uh, Goodhart into our uh, future work. And uh, when we think about the demographics and uh, and aging processes, uh, but um, uh, kind of. Uh, initially, at this uh, at this stage, I, I think about this issue this way. So, uh, the aging process uh, process we can in in terms of uh, the setup of 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 the global integrated uh, monetary and fiscal model, uh, we can uh, get these uh, dynamics using the uh, the combination of two shocks. First is uh, uh, increase in the dependence ratio, uh, which is the population uh, age uh, uh, six uh, over sixty five over the working age population. Uh, the increase of this, which is a pure dy uh, dy demographic factor, and the second layer is the uh, change over the preference of the household to consume the non-traded goods. So when uh, people get uh, kind of get older, um, uh, they uh, they need to uh, take, uh, take uh, you know, health services, uh, kind of uh, uh, increase the consumption of this, this kind of services and goods, which are mostly non-tradable. Uh, right and the and the share of of the consumption basket uh, towards the non-traded goods will increase. So the combination of these two shocks, uh, changing consumption preferences and the increasing dependency ratio, we can uh, kind of interpret as a uh, as an aging 
aging scenario, right? Increase uh, increase in aging. Uh, but at this point, at the at the next slide, uh, I have only the second part of the of the story, which is a change over the uh, you know consumption preferences towards the non traded uh, consumption goods. When it happens, um, uh, at the long run, you can see that um, uh, investment in GDP, uh, this is the aggregate, uh, aggregate for the Japan, are lower, uh, are lower compared to the initial uh, initial steady state. Why? Because the uh, increasing uh, increase uh, because the uh, changing uh, changing preferences results in a more uh, flow of the resource uh, resources from the uh, traded sector to non-traded sector, where the average productivity is much more lower compared to the tradable sector, and where the uh, uh, where the higher proportion of the skilled uh, you know skilled labor is uh, are the tradable. Uh, so that's a kind of. Um, uh, very initial uh, initial results of what uh, we have. We just started this uh, this project. We utilized this uh, this. <laughs> I'm sorry, but monster model. It's uh, thousands and thousands of uh, equations with a lot of sectors and going stage by stage and incorporating all the necessary features we uh, um, um, we need to uh, kind of capture this uh, this uh, this kind of stories uh, uh, i think in any um, in the nearest future we uh, can come up with um, uh, other results which will be interesting uh, to present to you and uh, get your feedback uh, thanks Perhaps I might say just a few words um, about this. Um, well, whereas much of it is very good, I find it rather difficult to see how one would distinguish between skilled and unskilled capital. I don't, just don't see how you would do that. Uh, it's difficult enough, I think, to distinguish between skilled and unskilled labor. So that is much more easily possible. Uh, my own preferences for what they're worth, and they're not worth very much, is that rather than focusing on the on uh, skilled versus unskilled, uh, I would focus on sectors. So I would focus on tradable goods sector, the service production sector, construction, and other. And I would look at the your production functions by sector rather than by skill. But that's my preferences, and I don't feel them very strongly, because uh, this is an area where you're certainly much better at doing this than I am. And you were talking, you did talk about tradable goods versus other uh, versus non-tradables. So clearly that does enter into your model somewhere. But um, um, how on earth do you distinguish between skilled capital and unskilled capital? It just doesn't seem to me to be feasible. You're right. Um, uh, I think you're. At, I think you're absolutely right. It's it's partly uh, uh, a way of de dealing with a very uh, difficult problem with a trick. Charles, okay, that that might, might be like in the example that I gave about uh, I don't know if you were here about my friend uh, uh, that used to he he actually uh, uh, took Walmart Global, <laughs> so that's what his job was before he managed a bunch of executives, right? And the question is, are those skilled or unskilled labors? Well, that's like, labor, like and that I agree, you can do it. With labor, I, I, you can look at various categories and you can say that's a skilled category and that's a yeah, yeah. category. I just don't see how you can do it with capital. And the models, the formula that you put on the on the on, on the, the slide did actually have the words skilled capital and unskilled capital. And I just don't don't follow. Yeah, that that's category. no, you're you're absolutely right. It's a technical, it's like a technical thing where we're trying to use kind of a Dixit Stiglitz thing where we have to aggregate things. Okay. But, but, uh, but things could be like different technology could, 
could uh, affect things differently, and it gives us a it gives us a a, a way of dealing with, with that. But but you could think about it. Uh, for example, uh, if you're talking about hiring uh, uh, Filipino uh, workers, okay, that typically do um, you know the taking care of elderly people, they, they specialize uh, a little bit of that, and they have a wage. And we can ask, you know, if we were to to bring in a specific type of technology, and we have to define that some way, like capital and so on. For an advanced economy, that technology might be different than for a poorer country, okay? But we're just trying to bundle those two things together, okay, That we where we can talk about how much could we substitute one for the other. Okay, now uh, you're absolutely right uh, 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 that it's hard to think about, <laughs> uh, you know, what is uh, skilled capital and, and what is skilled capital. But at the end of the day, we're bundling them together to produce some output. Okay, so that's, you know, the, uh, uh, so it's not it's not meant to be something that I think would be easy for us uh, to measure. Okay, uh, unless we had micro data. Uh, uh, and so on, uh, but but, but, you've, got, but you, you, you've got you, you raise a good point. You've got micro data by sector, so I would and I, I you know your approach is fine, but you've got to go where the you you know with where, where the numbers are in a sense, and they are in terms of sector. So you can do labor and capital in tradable good sector and labor and capital in the services sector. And to some extent, that might have some uh, sort of spillover equivalence to your skilled versus unskilled capital. You know, the capital in running a um, running yeah, a, yeah, yeah. A, a dining room or uh, uh, is quite different. But then, of course, the capital in running a hospital is pretty damn skilled. Um, but... Um, I think that sector Louis doing it on a sectoral basis, as as is, is the sort of way that I would go. But uh, you know, this is outside my sort of area of expertise. So. Anyhow, it's um, early days, so um, <laughs> I'm, uh, give I'm, us going to, I'm going to say goodbye now and thank you. Okay. All. Cheers. Thank you, thank you, Charles, for uh, joining us. A pleasure. And, uh, I'll See come you. back again. Bye. Thank See you. ya. Bye. So, hi, Cass. Um, skilled and, and unskilled capital. I just think about it as it's the capital that you're bundling with the uh, uh, with the unskilled uh, workers. And so maybe there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe we don't have to call it that. We just call it that, that there's some capital that, uh, that gets bundle like when you buy a machine um uh it's capital and you're you're combining it unskilled yes bob please i when you when you describe it what you're more what you're interested in you can have two kinds of capital in fact you, should, you can have lots of different kinds of capital but it's not that the sum is unskilled or the sum is only bundled with unskilled stuff it's that there's different substitutions between some types of capital and unskilled labors and other types of capital and skilled labors, right? Which is just a parameter in your model. So both of those bundles should include all kinds of capital, right? And then you get at what you want, let's say two kinds, and then you get at what you, I'd say just the way you described it I, I, intuitively, the way you get your result is by having one type of capital that is highly substitutable for skilled labor and another type of capital that is highly in sub, but both but both sectors, if I can put it that it's not right with saying it, but both of those sub aggregates in principle have access to both types of capital. And they're choosing to use, and they might both they might use both for some reason. It would depend on the relative price, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so instead of having two instead of matching the capital up. That way, the, that match should be part of the result of the model, not built into the model. See what I mean? Well, you're, it seems to me that's what you're trying to intuitively capture. You know, at this point, 
what we're looking for is we need to um, dig deeper into the actual data and the technology. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we really need to get more on uh, like what kind of robots are, are actually be, uh, being used. So they do have um, like the robots that you can imagine in a hospital where you can use robots to, to wander around and, and to make the, you know, the workers more productive because they can do some of the jobs. You can have robots for like helping to lift older people uh, in beds. In other words, making them stronger, like, you know, like, uh, and you, and, 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 and you have robots that monitor people automatically. Right. I mean, I don't know if you'd be in the hospital, but you're hooked up to these things, these machines, these are robots too. Right. And they send so, so, so that uh, means that nurses don't have to come around and see you all the time. They can just sit at their desk and monitor a whole bunch of patients at once. Right. That's another kind of robot that's pretty widely used and has been for a long time in hospitals. So it seems to me that what you want to do is, again, I would say you want to look at different, it's going to depend on the data, at different types of capital. Let's take a simple example. Um, computers versus hammers, okay? And, uh, and you know, uh, an office worker has access or, or the person who, the, the company that hires the office worker has access to both computers and hammers. Now, I guess there's not going to be very many hammers being used, but that's not because they don't exist or the, they, can't, they can't use them. It's just that the substitutability of hammers for office workers is very low. Right. Whereas the substitute substitutability or the complementarity, maybe, maybe I'm thinking of complementarity, whatever, uh, with computers is very high. On the other hand, you've got a carpenter, and the opposite is true. Right. And you build that, you you depending on your data, you build that into your production function parameters. You've got to make assumptions about the substitution of these, or you can estimate the substitutions of these the substitution parameters of these two things. And what you'll find if you do it right is that office workers don't use very many hammers and construction workers don't use very many computers. Um, right. Um, rather than saying in advance that a hammer is unskilled capital somehow, whatever that's supposed to mean. I agree with, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Charles. I can't imagine even, even in principle what unskilled capital is supposed to mean. Um, frankly, except that it's more substitutable for unskilled workers. But again, that should be in your that that should be in in your production function parameters, right? Not in yeah. finding the capital in advance, right? You're going to have a bunch of different types of capital. I also agree with Charles that you should look at, um, you know, in uh, you know, try and bore down into industry level data, even firm level data. Um, Right. There's a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot. It, it's a big problem for macro in a way. Well, it's not a big problem given that you're interested in that. But for this kind of stuff, I think it's a bigger problem that there's a lot of heterogeneity in both workers and capital. Right. Um, and in the production processes of different sectors or even different firms. And that I think that heterogeneity is at the heart of the issue in a lot of ways. Right. And and by aggregating everything up, I think you're missing a big part of the picture. The other thing I thought about was um, input output tables. Now, they're pretty aggregate, but not down. It's not two goods or anything like that or two sectors. Um, you know, you, you could try and trace through using input output tables. Nasty, though they are. Uh, they, you know, if you have if you have computerization, that's going to show up in some sectors and that's going to percolate through. You know, the outputs of that sector are going to percolate through into other sectors. And that might give you a handle on uh, the effects of robotization. Um, it seems to be a very micro question, not a macro question, this robotization thing. It doesn't seem to be very interesting to me as a macro, as a macro issue. To, 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 I view robotization really as a micro issue. I guess is the I guess is the bottom line of what I'm saying, you know. So it's all very well to say, okay, you're going to have you know real GDP and real investment, and that's going to work, and that's fine. But I, you know, I think if you I think if you want to find out how robotization is going to affect things like 
distribution of income, uh, changes in sectoral outputs and stuff like that. It really is more a micro question than a macro question. Which means, uh, you know, I think means more dis the more disaggregation, the better. As a, as a sort of a bottom line. Uh, hey, so so uh, just to be uh, concrete, so we could think of uh, sectors like you have the non-traded sector that takes care of old people, and you have the non-traded sector that uh, that does something else. Okay. Yeah, runs grocery stores, for example, <laughs> and and um, and what and what we care about is is uh, is what the elasticities the substitution between those two sectors are. So we got data. You can think of it. Uh, the hospitals are going to be different too. Okay, like uh, yeah, you can even think well, you can even think about if you build a hospital from scratch and. And don't take any constraints as given that you're going to get a different, uh, potentially different kind of robots um, than than if you're building everything from scratch and so on. Yeah, yeah. If, um, if, if you, if, so if you, you can, can have more. If, if you can disaggregate down to the level of individual hospitals, I think that'd be great. I used to say the more the better. Um, but you know, there's a limit to what the data are and how how much time you've got to do that kind of thing. Uh, so you know, I I want to I want I'm you know I I'm try, trying to tread a line here between what is perfect, which I would go down to every factory, um, if I could if I could, right, or every hospital or every delivery service, you know, uh, if I could, um, and 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 work out a production function for every one of them, or estimate a production function for every one of them, but that's that you know, that, that's you know, wow. It, Maybe if you get enough money, uh, <laughs> that's a big, big, big job. So I'm trying to think of data that like input output tables, which are what, like 40 by 40 or something like that. Um, you know, that, that where there are data and you can estimate a production function for each one of those, um, at least a Cobb Douglas production function and maybe a CES production function for each from data for each one of those sectors. Um, that's been done. Um, that was done some time ago. Uh, so you can you can do that. Um, whether the estimates are any good or not is another matter. And then different kinds of capital and labor. Again, there's lots of different kinds of labor. And there's lots of different kinds of capital. Um, it's not just skilled and unskilled capital. I mean, is a truck skilled or unskilled? I don't know. But it's certainly true that, say, in a hospital, they probably don't use very many trucks. Um, DHL uses a lot of trucks. Um, are DHL drivers more or less skilled than the average hospital worker? I don't know. I would guess less skilled. But I would say, but who knows? Um, what's the skill level of the average hospital worker? I don't know. Um, there's all these sort of things, right? Um, so it seems to me you just have to come up with a uh, some sort of both feasible, but also sort of intuitive. This I find this unskilled, skilled capital so unintuitive. A bit like Charles, I think, <laughs> so unintuitive that I, you know, it, it's it it, it it just stops me. It just stops me in my tracks. <laughs> sure. As soon as you mention that, I say, "What's going on?" <laughs> that, so. I would just say the, a better way of going about it would be to decide on different types of capital, you know, uh, robots versus non-robots. I mean, and then you just define what, what you think a robot is and you live, you live or die with that difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. You just say robots versus non-robots, right? And you live and die and you're going to have to make a decision in terms of data of what's going to be a robot, what's not going to be a robot. And you just live with that. Uh, there's there's going to be no... Um, you know, there, 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 there's going to be no clear, there's going to be edge cases, right? But that's like, uh, and that's fine. Uh, and yeah, so, yeah. and so, and then you would plug all those into your, into your sectors, robots versus non-robots, robots with everything else, right? Um, and say everything else is more or less the same compared to robots at least, right? 
See, and that'd be all right. I mean, I can see. I mean, like to me, that's pretty intuitive, right? You say robots are just so because that's why you're doing robots, right? After all, somebody thinks somebody's asking you to do robots because they think robots are a lot different than other kinds of capital, right? So indulge them. <laughs> and say, okay, right. we're gonna have robots, and all the other capital is basically perfect substitutes, but they're not yeah, perfect. But... And all the robots are okay, perfect. right? Okay. Right. So let me, so let me, let me, okay, let me try to try some intuition, okay? Because, um, so we, we're taking care of some old people, okay? And there's some things for the output of the old people, okay? Like, uh, that we can separate in the sense that there's something that robots can do with unskilled labor that can produce some output, okay? Uh, that we need to take care of old people. And there are right. some things that we can't do with those robots okay so we can't get them to to do operations uh i don't think you should, uh, i i don't think you should go down this this line because you're going to use the trouble with that is right is that if you think if you think about the kind of production function i think this is the wrong way to think about it i mean it's the right way to think about it in the real world but in terms of modeling which is a different matter to me it seems the wrong way to think about it because you think of the production function that you're going to have the production so it's going to be really weird. It's going to be, I mean, you're going to, you're going to be using these CES production functions. The important part about a CES production function is it's really smooth. There's no, I mean, the distinction you make can't be built into a CES production function, right? So don't talk about it like that. Unless you're prepared to go for, for, for example, for a whole bunch of Leontief production functions, something weird like that. And I do not recommend going that way, but you could. Um, then you know I don't I I, I I don't think you should I mean I, I agree with your intuition in the real world I mean I, I, I mean you're right but it's a modeling strategy it, it, it does it's not a very good way to talk about what your modeling strategy is let me put it that way I think you should just you know because you're going to you're, you're bound to be using these you know these smooth smooth production functions with a constant elasticity of substitution like they say right so it's going to be you know one percent thing is going to get a one percent thing whereas you know what you're saying is that you know it just drops off to zero right um and yeah, it'd be a good model. I mean, it'd be a terrific, uh, <laughs> be a terrific model. I don't know whether it's feasible. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, um, but I, I, I don't think I would use that intuition to justify the sort of model you're building. No, I would use not just. I, I, I mean, I would use the usual just I mean, you know, if you're building a, a agri consumption fund, a agri production function, you know, solo, right? Heater says all labor is the same, all the capital is the same, and there's a substitution between capital and labor. That's the end of it. He doesn't worry about hammers or robots or anything like that, um, you know. And the substitution is pretty smooth, right? Uh, that's why you use a Cobb-Douglas production function. If you don't think the substitution is smooth, you can't use that kind of production function. So you got to think, and you're going to use that kind of production function to practice. So you got to you got to think it's smooth. If you see what I mean? Mm, okay. Um, I guess. Or um, is there anybody else that would like to comment on that or anything else? Uh, thanks, Bob, um, for your comments. Uh, I need to think about uh, all this talk movement. Of course, the data, uh, like sectoral, different types of uh, for the labor. Uh, I think it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it will be easier to kind of distinguish between uh, sectors, between skills, and uh, but, but for the capital, yeah, totally agree. It's kind of challenging. Uh, yeah, we need to um, a deeper look at the data and come up with uh, kind of uh, kind of strategy. Maybe new uh, change the setup a little bit to uh, make sense uh, all these uh, all these things and the environment of the models uh, sensible for and uh, a much more uh, reliable uh, for you and uh, for uh, other audience. I, no, I, so, I, I, I mean, I agree in the same it, that, you know, I, I think in a project like this, you know, the data is going to be your ultimate constraint here. 
right? Yeah. Uh, um, and so, yeah, I absolutely agree with what you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to root around a little bit to find out, you know. So Charles wants uh, all this sexual stuff, right? Well, that's I, I agree with that. Uh, that's a good that, that's a good way of uh, thing. And the question is, is how much sexual data you can get that matches up labor, different kinds of labor, different kinds of capital, and the sectors all at once, so you can estimate, you know, a reasonable production function out of it. And I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think that's going to be. I think the answer to that question is going to be a big factor governing how much you know what you can do so i i absolutely agree with you okay well um thanks bob um uh, for joining us uh, we appreciate your comments as usual and we'll probably follow up uh maybe i guess and i will uh will contact you uh, after we've thought about it maybe check out uh, what our, our plans are okay so yep. so thanks a lot everybody um and i guess <laughs> this is really new work okay and i guess has been uh, working uh, really really hard okay so no it uh, is this is this is you know this is sort of you know and, and groundbreaking stuff i think i mean, I, have, I haven't seen anybody that takes very serious i mean there's industry studies for example, you know, that look, look at it, case studies essentially, but doing it in a sort of a coherent framework like this, I think it, it's a big challenge, but the rewards could be substantial. So I wish you go, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Thanks, Bob. I guess thanks everybody for, uh, we're holding on. We're we're streaming. Uh, this is new for us, so we have a very small audience. But um, uh, but uh, uh, lots of people are interested in it and watch it afterwards. So so thanks um, uh, for I think our first successful uh, uh, seminar, uh, the launch of the Charles Goodhart uh, seminar. So so thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, coming. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.